This video is the second one in a series about electropotentials and cells for A-level chemistry. In the first video, we looked at how you make an electrochemical cell, what the conventional representation is for writing them down and what some of the rules for that are, and also the standard hydrogen electrode. In this video, we're going to look at what you can actually use these standard potentials for and doing some calculations, working out potential differences for cells and that kind of thing. If you build a circuit with a cell in it, like the kind of circuit that you would have built in year seven physics, that cell has a potential difference. It has a certain amount of power to push electrons around and to cause a current to flow. And the exact same thing is true when you have an electrochemical cell. We have a potential difference and that's going to cause a current to flow. And we can measure that potential difference in volts. Now, when we're talking about an electrochemical cell, we'll sometimes call it electromotive force or EMF. For a metal, it's measured relative to the standard hydrogen half cell or the standard hydrogen electrode, which we met in the last video. Remember, it has to be standard because if the standard conditions are changed, then the EMF will change. So if you have a cell that includes half cells that maybe don't have a concentration of one molar, or if you tried to measure it at a different temperature or at a different pressure, then the EMF would change for that cell. So here's one example of this. We've got two half cells which both contain copper and both contain copper sulfate. And you would expect that that would mean, well, there isn't any difference, so there isn't going to be any current flowing, and also there isn't going to be any potential difference to measure. But actually, there is a potential difference. And the reason for that is that these aren't both standard half cells. The one on the right is a standard half cell with a concentration of one mole per decimeter cubed, but the one on the left has a much lower concentration. And so there is a difference between the two half cells, and we do see a potential difference. Now, if we know the potential of two half cells, we can calculate without needing to put them together what the overall potential difference of a whole cell made of those two half cells would be. But we can also do something quite cool. We can use that to figure out whether a redox reaction containing those two species would actually work or not, whether it would be spontaneous, whether it would happen on its own. In any given cell, you have two half cells, and one of those half cells is undergoing oxidation and the other one's undergoing reduction. But how can you figure it out? In the first video, we said that there'll always be a tendency for electrons to flow from a more reactive metal to a less reactive metal. But unfortunately, I haven't quite memorized the entire reactivity series yet. So I need to be able to figure this out without knowing what's the more reactive metal. So you can see that I've got my potentials here for, um, for each one of these half cells. And you'll note that the one for tin is positive and the one for zinc is negative. So what this tells me is that tin is good at being reduced. It's a strong oxidizing agent. And this reaction will proceed in the direction that it's written in. And then my negative zinc one is actually going to proceed in the opposite direction. So we're going to go from solid zinc back to aqueous zinc two plus ions. Now, that would be the case even if um, the zinc weren't actually a negative number, as long as it was less positive than the tin. So say if my standard potential for a zinc half cell was plus 0.05, that's still less positive than the one for tin. And so this reaction is still the one that would be reversed. OK, it's about the relative positiveness of them, not the fact that one's positive and one's negative. So once I know that, I can flip my zinc equation over and I can say that my overall ionic equation for this cell would be my tin four plus ions together with zinc in its atomic form going to tin two plus ions and zinc two plus ions. Here's another similar example. Again, we've got the standard potential of zinc, but this time it's been paired with copper. Remember, when you're writing these standard potentials, you do need to actually write the positive sign if it's positive. It's not just implied. Now, the electrons are going to flow from the negative place to the positive place because, you know, electrons are negative. So here they're going to flow from the zinc half cell to the copper half cell. This tells us that the reaction where the zinc is oxidized to Zn2 plus ions is feasible, but the reverse reaction isn't. And if I'm going to put these half equations together to make an ionic equation, I'm going to flip the more negative or less positive one around. Once I know which one of my reactions is going to proceed in the direction I expect it as a reduction and which one I'm going to have to flip over, I can start thinking about what the overall potential difference for a cell will be. And that's important for two reasons. One, because I might want to actually make this cell and use it to power something, but also because it will tell me something about whether a redox reaction between those two species would actually happen or not. So if we use the example from the previous slide, um, I've got my two half cells. I had my tin half cell and my zinc half cell. So the potential difference for that cell is going to be the difference between those two numbers. So my first one is always going to be my, 
more positive one. So in this instance, it was um, my tin, which had a potential difference, uh, sorry, a standard potential of plus 0.15. And then from that, I subtract my less positive potential. So you can think of it a bit like um, the range between the two numbers, if you imagine if you wrote them on a number line. So it's always going to be the more positive cell take away the less positive cell. And the reason we're taking it away is because we're doing that reaction backwards. So this is one of those concepts that just makes a lot more sense once you've had a go at it for yourself with some numbers. So you've got six questions here. For each one, you need to find the right half equations, decide which one will go in the forward direction and which one will go in the reverse direction so that you can write an ionic equation for each reaction. And then also figure out what the overall EMF for the cell will be. So pause the video and have a little go now. So for our first reaction, we've got zinc with a potential of minus 0.76 and nickel with a potential of plus 0.25. The nickel is the more positive standard potential, so therefore that reaction will proceed in the forward direction and the zinc will be flipped. And then the difference between minus 0.76 and plus 0.25 is plus 1.01. .01. Then for silver with iron, silver with a potential of plus 0.80 is more positive than iron with plus 0.77. So we're going to flip the iron equation over and the difference between those two is only going to be plus 0.03. Um, magnesium is way less positive than copper. So the copper is going to happen in the forward direction as expected and the magnesium is going to be reversed and there's a difference between those two numbers of plus 2.71. Um, barium is again far less positive than tin, so you're going to flip the barium equation over and we end up with, um, with an EMF for the whole cell of plus 3.05. Silver is much more positive than chromium, so, um, so the silver happens in the forward direction and the chromium um, reaction is reversed. Um, and then this last one was a little bit sneaky because I haven't actually given you the, um, the potential for hydrogen, but hopefully you remembered that hydrogen is defined as having a standard potential of zero. So that allows you to complete that question. It's important that as well as being able to use the numerical data to write down the right equation, you understand what's actually happening and you can describe and explain this using words. So in this example that we've already met, we've got the electrons flowing from the more reactive zinc to the less reactive copper. And this is shown by the fact that the more reactive zinc has a more negative value for its standard electrode potential. And that will always be the case because it's a more powerful reducing agent. Remember, reducing agents are themselves oxidized. So what's actually happening to the zinc is that the zinc here is being oxidized back into the zinc ions at all. And this is shown by the fact that this number here is, well, not that it's negative, but that it's less positive than the value for copper. Here's another chance to pause the video and make sure that you've understood this. So for each example, you're going to describe in words what will happen, explain why, and then calculate the potential difference for that whole cell. In the first example, we've got um, a half cell for silver that has a positive standard potential and then one for zinc that has a negative standard potential. So obviously the silver is more positive and therefore the electrons are going to flow from the zinc to the silver. So electrons flow from zinc to silver because zinc has a more negative standard potential because it's a more powerful reducing agent. And then we do our little calculation and we work out that the EMF for that cell is positive 0.156 volts. Remember, it's really important that you write the positive sign. Then for our next example, we've actually got two positive standard potentials. So remember, the electrons are going to move from whichever one is more negative or less positive, whichever way you prefer to think about it, to the other one. So here they're going to flow from the nickel to the iodine half cell because nickel is effectively more negative because it's a more powerful reducing agent. And if you work out the difference between those two standard potentials, you have a value for the cell of plus 0.29. And then in our final example, we're back to one positive, one negative. So you know the electrons are going to flow from the more negative value to the more positive value. So the electrons go from the iron half cell to the copper because iron has a more negative value because it's a more powerful reducing agent. And if you work out the difference between those two half cells, we get um, a potential for the whole, a potential difference for the whole cell of positive 1.11 volts. We can also start to use this data to make predictions about whether or not chemical reactions will happen. So for instance, here we're asked whether a series of metals or metal ions would be able to liberate copper from a solution of copper chloride. 
So the answer is that zinc, nickel and tin are more powerful reducing agents than copper because they have more negative values for their standard potential and therefore they would be able to displace the copper whereas the others wouldn't. So now we're really into thinking about redox reactions rather than actually the cells themselves, but the same rules apply. So if you're trying to figure out whether or not a reaction is feasible, what you need to do is pretend like you're making a cell and calculate what the overall electromotive force is. And if it's more than zero, then the reaction is feasible and it could potentially happen, although it might not for other reasons. And if it's less than zero, then the reaction isn't feasible and it's not going to happen. So in this problem, we're looking for a reducing agent that will allow this first reaction to proceed but won't allow the second one to proceed. We're trying to avoid reducing this so far that we end up with vanadium three plus ions. So I've got three options. Remember, if I'm looking for a reducing agent, I'm going to find it on the right hand side of my half equations because these are reduction potentials. So a reducing agent is going to be oxidized, which means I want one of these three equations to kind of run in reverse. So my three options are chloride ions, ion two plus ions and zinc. And what I'm looking for numerically is something where my first one, take away whatever this number down here is, is greater than zero, which means that that reaction is feasible. But my second one, take away the number down here, is less than zero. So it's not feasible because that means that the reduction will stop after the first step. It won't continue to be reduced. So if I look at my chloride to begin with, I've actually got a more positive standard potential here than, um, than my equation one. So actually my chloride ions aren't going to um, reduce my vanadium. If I was going to put those two together, it would actually be the chlorine based equation that would go in the forward direction and my vanadium based equation would actually um, go in reverse. So um, chloride ions are no good to me because um, they're not going to reduce the vanadium. Then if I look at my, um, if I look at my zinc, then what I see is that, yes, I, um, I am going to be able to reduce my vanadium using zinc. But the problem is that zinc is too powerful of a reducing agent. And actually, it's going to be able to, um, to reduce my vanadium all the way to a V3 plus iron. But if I look at my, um, my potential for my iron redox half, um, half cell, then that's kind of that's my Goldilocks. OK, it's, it's just right, because if I put these two um, together for my first one, um, for my, my first reaction, I end up with an overall um, potential difference of 0.23, positive 0.23. So that reaction is feasible. But if I um, if I then try to do the same thing with the second reaction, I end up with a negative number. So that means that that's not feasible. So my answer here is that iron two plus is a reducing agent that would allow the first step to proceed, but not the second step. So you now know how to calculate the potential difference for an electrochemical cell and also how to use standard electro potentials to deduce whether a redox reaction would be feasible or not. Thanks for watching and if you'd like to see more of these videos, don't forget to subscribe.